we had a great upbringing, more traditional though, in terms of what women should do, what men should do, and what the roles are there. And Especially. I, it just wasn't what I thought it would be once I was exposed to it. And to be honest, it was the money that made me want to go there first. Because Normally, it was... so what do we do? We sit back, relax, wait for things to happen, or is it time for Australia to invest more in research and development? Honestly, the women I've met in the industry are amazing. I think we all back each other and we're kind of drawn to each other when we meet. Um, like the other day I went to an event. Um, I know there might be just, um, this is a hard question and if you don't want to answer it, don't right. answer it. Do you trust these people? Senior leadership or board, board level members are now personally liable in the event of a breach. I, AI and cyber security. Yep. What's the link between the two? Where's the threat? Where, um, or is, is there any threat? And for me, I don't want to just think of diversity as having more females. I think race is important. You in know, people... I, don't know. I know it's a $1 billion question if you can answer that. I don't know. Not. I don't know, honestly. I wish I had a crystal ball bowl. <laughs>
And I think just financial independence and achieving things on my own, that's what gave me satisfaction and has driven me from my school age to now. So how much does the surfboard play the major role in your life? How you're asking about my roof racks <laughs> exactly. on my car? <laughs> uh, I just love the ocean, to be honest. It's like my happy place. Um, so, I mean, now my daughter's learning it too. I bought her one. So I think we're <laughs> pretty assimilated, I'd say, for now. But I think for me, it was just something different. Like my parents thought it was really odd. Like I've got these ethnic parents who are like, my kid is surfing. <laughs> What's going on? Um, but it was just an activity I enjoyed. Was it a shock for your mom? Oh, yeah. I just went and bought a board and came home and shoved it in my car and off I went as soon as I could drive. Um, but it was just, I like to be different and I just like what I like so it was just something I loved I loved playing soccer as well that was traditionally a boy sport when I was growing up but as soon as I made my own money had a car I was like off surfing playing soccer doing all the things <laughs> probably <laughs> made my mum roll over seeing but um yeah I just it was just something I enjoyed I didn't do it to conform with anyone okay. it's just something that brought me so joy. obviously do you have a big family or just it's all Tanya uh and yeah no I've got I've got we had three I'm the eldest, so I paved the way for my siblings. I did all the rebelling for them so they okay, could have freedom. So, okay. so they should be thankful to me. <laughs> um, but, yes, yeah, so I've got a younger brother and a younger sister. I'd definitely say I'm probably the more extroverted one, um, and I was definitely the more rebellious one <laughs> growing up. So I probably – my parents lost a few hairs, I think, up with my upbringing. Yeah, I can imagine that. You know, <laughs> what makes you say that? <laughs> Come on, I'll give you that inside. But I was just so independent and headstrong and I just thought differently and I wanted to do things my own way. And it's funny because I look at my kids now and, and they're the same and it's like my husband's in a house with three of me. So imagine that for him. <laughs> three tenures. <laughs> so you want to do it differently and in your own way. Yeah, definitely. Would you accept your kids to do yeah, it differently in your own way? They already are doing that their own way and I'm proud of that. So look, we have arguments, but then I realize I'm arguing with myself, like a smaller version. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, definitely. I just... um. As long as they're doing things for the right reason, they're doing things for the right way, mm. doing things that make them happy, not to just please others. I think I I encourage people not to be pleasers. It's like think about what brings you joy and do things for the right reasons. So it's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. So you, you did your high school, yeah. you went to uni. Yeah. Um, but really you ended up working in IT. Yeah. After all these years. Now, as a kid, were you ever did you ever <laughs> Think about yourself, I'm going to be working in IT no. and technology. No one ever thinks that. I think it's changing now, though. Like, mm. my daughter at school will do robotics and they do science. And it's I've seen the change in the curriculum. But for me growing up, no, we didn't even use computers, <laughs> barely. Like, yeah. IT was the most boring subject that I dropped in high school. <laughs> I kept all my other That's subjects. Fantastic. I did PE and design and technology and business. I enjoyed commerce and that side of things. English. But I dropped IT because it was learning around LAN networks and LAN networks. And I was so boring. <laughs> so boring. But I dropped it. And here we are, 16 years in tech. Okay. So what did you dream of when you were a kid? Um, look, I was always very physically active. So originally it was something maybe like physically active outdoorsy, but then I really loved fashion and that came from retail. So during uni, I mean, yeah, I studied and I did all right at uni, but I learned the most when I worked. What did you study at uni? I, commerce, commerce, marketing. Yeah. And, and then I worked in fashion as well in retail. And then I got exposure to that side of things. And then I started doing work experience in fashion as well. Um, but I think for me, when I think about what I'm passionate about, I've realized it's meeting like-minded people. Yeah. And in tech is probably where I've met the people that I'm most connected with. Some I'd consider as lifelong friends. So I think in fashion, when I went into that industry, it was very superficial. It just wasn't what I thought it would be once I was exposed to it. Um, and then as a graduate, I had an opportunity to go to Dell. And that was my first kind of leg into IT. And to be honest, it was the money that made me want to go there first because it was paying twice as much as what I was on as a grad in fashion. Uh, but 16 years on, I've stayed in that industry. So obviously, it's more than the monetary that's driven So me. really, you don't have to follow your heart in your no. life decision, yeah? No, and I think for me, it's as I said, it was like the people that I met and the like-minded people and the relationships I've built. That's what's kept me in the industry. Like, I was never that excited by technology. I genuinely see the value of cyber now and the the importance of it and the changing landscape of it. That interests me. But it's really the people, I think, that that's what's drawn me to the industry and kept okay. me. So, obviously, from one industry to another. Yeah. Completely different people. Yeah. Different interests. Yeah. Different, I don't know, way of thinking. So, you 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 did really find yourself in the IT yeah. environment. Um, what was the main difference between the two verticals? I mean, I think IT was a male-dominated industry. But I didn't mind that at the time. I thought it was quite advantageous being female because... 
I'm very lucky, I feel like, in my time period because it's been a big promotion of women in IT and women in tech and women in leadership positions. That's helped me, I think, being a female in tech, which mm. is such a traditionally a male-dominated industry, with now the big lens on having more women in tech. And big companies like Salesforce and other companies actually have um, you know, ratios of how many female they're meant to hire to males. So that's probably been beneficial for me, and that's been a big difference in the industry, I'd say, going from okay. fashion to tech. So your main drive was um, really just to find yourself yeah, and find yourself in an environment that really make you money. Yeah, the end. it was money actually. I was. Really important. Because I, I mean, as, as I mentioned from my childhood, like I attached money to freedom. So yeah. for me, being financially independent was important. And that's what I, and you know, our industry pays well. So that's kind of how I fell into the industry. But um, yeah. So what is freedom from Tanya's point of view? Just like being able to do what I want when I want. <laughs> now it's a little bit different with kids. I think for me, it's now setting them up for a good life as well. So but I'd for say Tanya, oh, what is freedom for me? For Tanya, yeah. Well, just like, I mean, I'm not the overly su superficial person, but I think it's like not having to overthink. Like if I want to go on a holiday, I can. If I want to buy something for my kids, I can. It's like not having to um, sacrifice or kind of scrimp and save for things. That for me is financial independence. Um, so that's what I think of. Can like, you live without work? No, I no. try to. I had like, well, I've had two kids, so they're six and three. I was on mat leave probably for four months in and my husband's like, you have to go back <laughs> to work. You're really annoying at home. It's just, I need to be motivated mentally. Mm -hmm. And I like just cooking and cleaning and I'm, he'd come home and he's like, why are you so happy to see me? <laughs> You're never this happy to see me. Mm -hmm. So I think like six months is what I lasted with both because yeah. I genuinely love my job. I love what I do. Mm -hmm. I enjoy working. It's never a chore. I love Mondays. <laughs> I'm one of those weird people that like Mondays. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably what's driven me. Like I genuinely enjoy what I do and I like going to work and I actually missed it. When I was at home with a baby, I missed the people that I worked with and achieving and like there's great recognition when you do a Remind good job. Remind me, I'm going to ask you another question okay. down the track. I but will. So after you knew you went and you started yeah. like, you didn't find yourself in fashion, you move on to IT, yeah. technology, yeah. and progressively you start just moving from one position to another. Yeah. Um, what was the most challenging phases in your life, in, my in your life? career life? I think for me, like when I had kids, I like really cared about my career and I was at a very pinnacle point of my career where I was doing really well. I was being very successful. And then I think having my first child, I found that really challenging because it really dented my confidence. Like I started questioning my ability and, you know, am I going to be able to come back and do what I was doing before children? Like I really questioned myself. So that was probably a very challenging time. Um, but then I, reached out to people who I saw as mentors in the industry and I spent time with them and they helped pick me back up. They reminded me of my value of what I've done, of what I've achieved. And then having my second, I realized it didn't impact me as much because I'd done it once. <laughs> and I thought, well, why not? It actually makes me better because I have a different opinion. I have more empathy now. It's actually made me a better human being. So I only see it as advantageous, to be honest. So is it okay for people just to take a break and yeah. find themselves and yeah. come back to, into this industry? Well, that's kind of how I ended up in cyber. So I think for me, even having time away made me, I was always like going, going, going at a hundred miles an hour. That's just how I do things. But having that time away actually made me reposition and rethink about what I wanted. Um, and that's kind of when I went from like IT, networking, infrastructure, more into cyber. That's when I pivoted after my first child. So I came back with a six month old into a new job and a new industry, kind of like cyber. Um, but it was really having that time away that made me reevaluate where I saw my career going. So yeah, I think it's great. It just gave me another lens and another perspective to. Okay. Now that you have mentioned cyber, yeah. cyber is playing a major role in this industry yeah. overall. And obviously there's a lot of hype around cyber yes. security uh, specifically over the last few years. Yeah. Now, whoever has been in this IT industry for more than 20 years, they know that cyber has always been there. Yes. Any system administrator would know that the struggle of building a firewall and setting the rule. What is the reason of all this hype from your point of view? Yes. About cyber specifically? I think for me now, it's like changing legislations where there's a lot more accountability on individuals. And I historically, I don't think that was there as much. So senior leadership or board, board level members are now personally liable in the event of a breach. If they haven't shown that they've taken the right actions to actually mitigate the breach happening and protecting people's data and sensitive information. So I think that's probably one big change that I've seen. Um, like an example of that would be the Soki Act. So the um, 
security of critical infrastructure. So now that's actually extended out recently to 11 in different industries, including telco, retail. So for me, it's just changing legislation and how that accountability has changed over the last couple of years. And now people are putting security at the forefront. Maybe before it was an afterthought, but now with that liability of them actually investing personally, it's become more of the forefront. More budget is being allocated to it. You know, that that kind of thing. So has it really become a priority from a business point of view in Australia? Have you seen it? 100%. I think historically as well, it's maybe been more the enterprise size organizations. But now, like the biggest growth for us where I work is more in the SMB space. So I think there's a big... Uh, recognition that even SMBs are going to be targeted. Their supply chain is going to be targeted. So I think there's a like a holistic um, understanding that it's everyone can be a target of a cyber so breach. So is it legislation, regulations, or is it fee? I think it's uh, a bit of both. Yeah, because I think when you see your competitor get breached or someone in your supply chain get breached and you see how that impacts their revenue, it's not just lost revenue and downtime, but your brand gets damaged. And if you're a small business, you can go out of business altogether if you haven't actually managed that situation properly. You know, for a bigger company, maybe they can avoid that. They might pay a fee or a penalty or whatever. But for a small organization, if they're down for a certain period of time and they lose that brand reputation, they could go out of business altogether. So... Okay. So, look, I'm running my own business. I don't actually know anything about cybersecurity. Um, I pick up the phone, I call Tanya. I say, Tanya, I need your help. Yeah. What is the process? What is the flow? What do I have to do? Where do I start? Yeah. Really? I think for me, so my role lies now within channel and working with channel partners, and that's where a consultative approach takes place. So for I've worked in partner land as well. So I'd say that was where I'd bring in a, a trusted partner to actually give me visibility. So what, what is the partner land from uh, from the viewers and the normal people on the street who don't actually... Yeah, what would they do? Yeah, well, what do they do? I think it's an educational thing. So it could be, you can have all the right technology, but sometimes it's like the people problem. It could be educating your people around what email not to click on or, you know, like being mindful of the risks out there. So I think it's um, not just having the right technology in place, which is kind of what you'd help with, but it's actually educating your staff, your people on what to look for and being mindful because you can have all the best kind of preventative measures in place and it can be one one wrong click of an email that can lead to that compromise happening. So for me, especially in smaller businesses, I'd say educating your people on what to look for. And, what, and just to be aware, a lot of vendors in the market, if they want to achieve scale, like I'm at CrowdStrike at the moment. Brain Splat Podcast. Partners. We don't go direct to the customer. Um, so for me, with my partners, like I actually see my role. I mean, some people look at channel and think it's just drinking and lunches and all that kind of stuff. Um, but for me, it's like I really want to understand my partners, like what their priorities are, what their business is, what makes them unique, and then give them the tool set to be successful with their customers via the vendor that they're aligned to, which is kind of what my role is. So for me, it's like understanding this partner, taking what they do, and then maybe building like a solution they can take to market to their customers um, around that cyber kind of posture. So what does it mean for me as a, as a consumer? Because yeah. I'm, I'm having uh, the cyber attack. I'm having the yeah. cyber threat. Um, I called Tanya. Tanya worked for a company. Yeah. And Tanya gave my business to someone else. Yeah. And then what, do I have to deal with many people? Is yeah, this think, how it works? I think it just depends on, like, well, you can have one partner that you're aligned to that looks after you holistically. There's sometimes different technologies. You want different best of breed technologies brought in to kind of help bolster your environment. But for you, it'd be an understanding of a roadmap of what your security posture looks like now and maybe in five years where you want to get to, what you want to achieve within that roadmap. And then within that, there's a plan of what you're going to do, what technologies you're going to implement. You know, what you might have certain compliance frameworks that you want to adhere to, like that, or you might want to adhere to the essential eight. So it's a very consultative approach. It's hard to give a kind of one answer, but yeah. it's more consultative, understanding what your goals are, where you want to be, where your workloads are going to be. Are you going to be compliant with certain like requirements based on the vertical you're working in? And thereafter, having a plan around how you're going to achieve that in terms of a roadmap. So is my assurance through... Uh the partner that you're using or my assurance is through you guys? Well, I'd say you would want to be engaging like a, a good partner that's going to help build that kind of plan for you, mm-hmm. I'd say, the cyber strategy. So we don't we don't do everything. Like, you know, there's certain areas where we would partner with different technology partners. But for you as a consumer, it's hard to know what the right thing is. So Correct. I'd say it, you, would want to, you would work with a, a partner, a channel partner, and they would help build that strategy for you, essentially, is how I'd suggest going about it. Okay. And so, obviously, they would just always revisit my business. Yeah. They would give me consultation. Yeah, and an ongoing managed service. So, it's not just kind of 
fixing things in the event of it, something going wrong, but it's that proactive health checks and the proactive touching points and making sure everything's like tuned correctly and working correctly. Um, you know, you were using all the technologies to the best they can be. So, yeah. Okay. So AI now also plays a major role. Yeah. AI and cybersecurity. Yeah. What's the link between the two? Where's the threat? Where, um, or is, is there any threat? I think AI has been around for a long time and now it's this buzzword that's kind of attached to it. Mm -hmm. So I think, yes, definitely. I think threat actors are now capitalizing on using AI to do their threat actions and actually do the attacks and things like that. So I think we've always had AI, but it's kind of come to the forefront. There's like all these buzzwords that get thrown around like zero trust and uh, there's so many of them. I feel like AI is one of them. I feel like AI has been around forever. So it's just um, a matter of kind of taking that and building it into the technology. Okay. So you've been in, in this industry for, I don't know, 15 years yeah. now. You've seen a lot of changes. Yeah. Um, we've been through um, cloud migration, yes. adoption, then cybersecurity, AI now. What is next from, or where do you see this industry is going next? What is the next big thing that will just hit okay. the market? I don't know. I know it's a $1 billion question <laughs> if you can answer that. I don't know. I don't know, honestly. I wish I had a crystal ball, but I wouldn't build <laughs> Yeah, it is a really hard question yeah. to predict. I just, um, I just, for me, I'm interested in like the political landscape and how that's going to change because I think that's going to impact where people put their priorities and budgets. Um, so I mentioned earlier, there's more personal liability, but I think there's more and more compliance requirements and things like that coming into the mix. So um, I'm seeing a lot of consolidation. So I'm seeing a lot of partners acquiring other partners, a lot of vendors buying a lot of vendors. So I think in cyber, traditionally, there's been a lot of point products. And what I'm seeing a lot in the market is a lot of consolidation where they're coming together and customers aren't wanting a whole bunch of point products. They're wanting to kind of consolidate and maybe pick one or two mm. that they're going to invest in and go all in with. Um, so that's probably what I'm seeing as one of the biggest trends, that consolidation of mm -hmm. technology stacks. So where do you see Australia now in comparison to everyone around the world? Are we an early adopter for technology? I and... think we're not quite there yet. But I like I mean, I follow Claire O'Neill and that's her goal is to get Australia in the forefront of cybersecurity. Um, I think there are a lot of companies that maybe do launch their products in Australia as a testing bed because we're a good market. Um so, Good morning, unless someone who doesn't actually, we don't even exist in the yeah, world. Or yeah. just, like, no, I think in terms, of, in terms of adopting planet. technologies as well, I think we're a good market in terms of test, like a test bed, um, in terms of people trying the technology. But in terms of where we're at, like legislatively and politically, I think there's still work to be done. Um, but as I said, I follow Claire O'Neill on LinkedIn and I watch her posts and I know that that's at the forefront of what she's working on and building. Mm. So normally, so what do we do? We sit back, relax, and wait for things to happen? Or is it time for Australia to invest more in research and development, be leaders in this industry? Or like, what is your view on that? Well, I think we are. We're like these changes in the legislation and holding people personally accountable. They're big changes that have come into play. So I think we are in the right direction of where we need to go. Okay. So... Do you think politically we are on we are on the right yeah, direction too? I think so, but I think the only issue is sometimes, like we can't keep up with the speed of threat actors changing. It is hard. Like they're very nimble, they're very quick, and sometimes by the time the political landscape keeps up with that, something's already changed. So I think that's probably the challenge. It's yeah. just the speed of making decisions politically versus the speed of the threat actors. That's probably the gap I'd see. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So another segment of um, technology and IT in general is uh, social media. Yeah. Um, what is your view on social media and how active are you? I think for me, like I kind of, it's weird because I generally have quite a separation between personal and work. So on LinkedIn, I'd say I'm pretty active and like I... What, is it a split of personality? Yeah, kind of, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird to go from mum to exactly. like corporate boss woman. <laughs> like that's always a thing that I've found difficult to mesh together. Um, I mean, social media freaks me out because I've got kids, two girls, and like one day they'll be on social media. So I'm always like, sometimes people pretend to be who they are and they're not really who they are. I'm already like dr drilling that into them. Um, but yeah, I think, like I don't see it as a bad thing. It just depends how it's used, right? And for me with LinkedIn, like, I've built a lot of relationships. I've built brands. I feel like it's important to build a personal brand. And I think if you use these tools correctly, it can help you do that. And look, look what we're doing now. We're doing a podcast. So clearly I'm not against it. Um, but I just think it's just be thoughtful of how you use these tools. Um, but yeah, for me, I do always separate personal 
Like my Instagram is very different to my LinkedIn. <laughs> it's like chalk and cheese. So I think it's interesting to kind of bring the two together, which is I would be really interesting in the, in watching your Instagram. Yeah, it will just be my kids usually, my <laughs> husband, <laughs> living my best mum life. But... So do you track your kids? Do they have accounts no. now? Or <laughs> yeah, Apple, like up? an Apple okay. tracker on them. <laughs> no, no, they're six and three. <laughs> oh, okay, <that's laughs> a, all they know how to do is swipe on YouTube every now and then, but no, not yet. Okay. So you mentioned... Um, one of the social media specialists in profession, in our professional world, um, which is LinkedIn. I didn't want to mention LinkedIn. Oh, but I didn't it is, <laughs> but, um, And obviously you have a big network uh, of people. Um, I know there might be just, um, this is a hard question, and if you don't want to answer it, don't right. answer it. Do you trust these people? Look, I've got a lot of really good people in my network, like people that I worked with at Dell. And it's been amazing because they've kind of been able to watch my journey. And I've had them approach me saying, oh, we're so happy to see where you are at now. Like, we remember you 16 years ago when you first started it on the phones, like cold calling <laughs> and to see where you are now. Um, so, yeah, like there's a lot of amazing people in my network and that I could reach out to. So, I mean, I, look, I don't know everyone in my network, but yeah, I'd say most people are genuinely good people. Trying so what's to the best. point in having this huge amount of yeah. uh, people in on your LinkedIn yeah. account? Oh, are it's coming so know? handy for me because like, for example, like a lot, I've done a lot of partner recruitment, bringing new partners on that I don't directly know, but I can see who connections are to them. So I've had opportunities where I've reached out to people going, you're connected to this person. Can you do an introduction? Can you broker an introduction? And I've been able to get meetings that way. So avoiding doing that cold call, which is uncomfortable. No one likes it, but making warm introductions. That's where it's really helped me a lot. And I've leveraged that a lot. Um, as a woman yeah. in, in, in tech, yeah. in, do you think... I know you mentioned it's a male dominant yeah. um, environment. Do you see it as a showstopper for you for no. for your end, like from your side, or not yeah, really? Makes me want to go harder. <laughs> and honestly, the women I've met in the industry are amazing. I think we all back each other, and we're kind of drawn to each other when we meet. Um, like the other day, I went to an event, and the size of the star was there. She was amazing. She saw me in the room. I was the only female. And we sat together. And we had the best conversation. She was lovely. Um, but I think not at all. I think it just drives me more to be successful when I see that. I like a bit of like a bit of competition and challenge. So, yeah, no, and the women I meet in the industry are amazing. We all, like, lift each other up. We're all very supportive. Um, there's a lot of events now promoting women in tech. So it's just, there's been a big shift in terms of the dynamics of the industry. So you're tech. happy with, like, with the way this yeah. this industry is yeah. evolving? Well, there's a recognition of the need to have yeah. more diversity. And for me, I don't want to just think of diversity as having more females. I think race is important. You know, people of different perspectives. Like, it's just not just about gender. And I always try and, when we talk about diversity, I always want to, like, steer away from just talking about gender. I think it's about different, like, as I said, jet, like, different races and things like that should come into the mix as well. So, um, yeah, I, like, I think it's going in a very positive direction. Excellent. So you've been in this industry for many years now, again, and uh, you've been in this race, and you've always been racing. Um, what is what is the secret of your success? Yeah. What make you? What made you just keep on going and never giving up? I mean, I do have an internal drive. Beside money? Yeah. No, I mean, that, that was like the initial getting me into the industry, but I'm not going to say that's my main motivator now. Um, look, I have an internal drive for sure. Uh, I just want to be my best every day. And that's not just at work. That's everything in my personal life as well. Um, also, I think I really want to be seen as a role model as well. Like I wanted people to see that you can have a successful personal life and work life. Like work life balance is often talked about, but to actually be able to have both, I think there's a perception that you may have to sacrifice one for the other. And I just never wanted to do that. I never wanted to just be successful and be a CEO of a company and not have a family, but I never wanted to stay home and just have a family. I thought I could achieve both. And for me, that's kind of, I want to show that I can be successful at both and be sort of a role model and align my values in both work and home and use that as my guiding principle, I guess. In but the you future. really have um, the privilege to have this balance between the two? Yeah. Then, like how you've succeeded in yeah. doing that. Why not? I mean, look, sometimes things fall. I forgot, I forgot grandparents' day at my kids' uh, school the other day and <laughs> didn't send anyone. Wow. I felt really bad. But there's always a ball that's going to get dropped and sometimes, you know, one aspect of your life needs more attention than the other. But I definitely think both can be achieved, definitely. Um, and then eventually when my kids are probably less dependent, I want to be able to give back as well. I think at the end of the day, when you're on your deathbed, people are just going to, uh, like remember how you've impacted them, how you've helped other people. So at the end of the day, that's kind of where I want to work towards being able to do. 
right now I'm like a, a duck with my feet, like kicking furiously under the water, <laughs> trying to look calm. And everyone's like, how do you do it? I'm like, honestly, why? I don't know. Like, I don't know what the answer is. But I think um, eventually being able to give back. But right now I'm just trying to kind of keep afloat. Could you have done it on your own, do you think? Yeah, like I think, well, now I have a network that I leverage. I've had people sponsor me and mentor me along the way. So that's definitely helped me get my next job and my next promotion. But yeah, like it, when I first started out, I didn't, like my parents came to the country and didn't speak English. So I was, I kind of had to just make it my own and build things myself. So I just put in the hard work and people notice, like when you show up every day, you have a good attitude, you work hard, you're reliable, you're on time, all those things. People notice that and they're drawn towards you and they want to sponsor you. Um, so I think I, like, I'm proud of what I've achieved, but at the same time, I've got some great sponsors and mentors along the way that have helped me get to where I am. So do you think if you do all or whatever you've mentioned, like, be on time, yeah. do it properly, you're going to succeed? Yeah, I think I think EQ takes you further than just being intelligent. Like, I'm not the most analytical person. I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm the most, like, I've done all right at school and uni, but I was never the top of my grade. But I always had good EQ. I was good with people. And I think that can actually take you further, especially in a sales career or in channel which is where I've sort of played, that can take you further than just being intelligent, being able to read the room, make people feel good. Like walk out of a meeting and the person wants to meet with you again mm. because you've said the right things and you've positioned things, thought on your toes, being prepared for the meeting. Um, so, yeah, I think for sure. Do you have your eye on any global positions? That no, does it really at the moment. You? Not really. Like I am always ambitious. I've been fortunate in my last couple of roles. I've never actually had to like really apply for a job. I've had people kind of approach me as I'm looking to leave or approach me with promotions and opportunities and things where they've gotten to know me, they've seen how I work and they've gone, oh, we think you'll be great at this. And they've sort of opened up doors for me, which has been amazing. Globally, no, because that once again, I talked about personal and like work balance. And I think if I was to look at that, it would really come to the detriment of my family. So I think that's like, I do see myself being in leadership roles, but global roles now where I'm traveling half the time, like I can't actually do that to my kids and my husband who, <laughs> my poor husband would kill me. So you're me. telling me if I, uh, if I yeah. offer you a job in a global position, yeah. um, a very senior position, and I would give you the choice between the job or your family, which one are you going to Well, that's choose? like harsh now that I've got my family. <laughs> that's hard. It depends. It depends on what flexib- what the requirements are of the role. Honestly, I can't answer that. Like, what does the global job entail? What's the end game? Like, am I sacrificing for a short period of time to kind of, or is that what it's going to be like for 10 years and I like completely to the detriment of my family? It's hard to answer. Like, if it's like one year of sacrificing. Would you start a job normally for like for a few months or you're always, yeah you have this big plan that you're going to stay in the same job for the next 10 years. No, like I never think that I'm going to leave. Like I've yeah. gone to a startup before as well and I thought I'd be there for years, but then things changed and I, you know, got offered this amazing role where I am now. Um, I never go into a role thinking I'm going to leave. I always think I'm going to be there for a while, yeah. but I, I think four and a half years is probably the longest I've stayed anyway. So I think it just depends because sometimes you can be in an organization where your role changes so much that it's like starting a new job. You're going to a new team. You're doing something completely different. So I don't think, I don't kind of set a goal. I just go in thinking, I want to be the best in my team. I want to stand out. I want to overachieve. That's kind of what I go in with every time I start a job. So obviously you've been through redundancies and retrenchment and so on, which is part of this (laughs) I've been pretty lucky. You haven't. No. (laughs) No, but you know, I think it can happen to anyone. And I think 100%. I haven't experienced it myself. So you haven't experienced no, it yet? No, I haven't yet. Yeah. <laughs> Wait for it. Well, <laughs> it's coming. No, because look, it is part of this yeah. industry. So do you ever think about it? Does it scare you? No. <laughs> At all? No. I feel, like, I feel like I have a lot to offer and I'm not like, I've got savings, you know, and I've got my husband. He's very supportive. He's always been very supportive. Mm-hmm. I think we're a team. So, you know, he's been made redundant before. So I've kind of been on the other side, but I've supported him where he's been made redundant. He's found something, you know? So I think vice versa, if that was to happen to me, I know that I have his support and his backing. So it doesn't really fill me with anxiety. I know there's a lot happening in our industry at the moment. I also think I have a lot to offer. I'm not going to devalue myself. I think the right role will come along if that was to happen. And I have a big network I can reach out to. So... Yeah, no, it's never really worried me, to be honest. You know, we've always um, talked about this before. Like, um, all, Actually, we always talk about this in this industry, that um, the perception that we are just numbers. Yeah. Uh, once you do your job, that. you just you disappear. Um, would you like to stay a number in a big environment or just have your own business and grow it yourself? I think you could still be unique in a big environment. 
I think you can offer a different like way of doing things. I mean, people have called me a cowboy. Probably I'm a bit of a cowboy. <laughs> like I kind of go in and I don't do things the way that they've always been done. I like to be creative and I think of different ways to skin a cat, I guess you could say. So I don't think in a big company, I think you still stand out in a big company. You can make your role unique. You can still stand out. Um, for me, it really depends on the leadership and the people I'm working with. I think that's what keeps me in the company, regardless of the size of the organization. It's who I'm working for, what the team is like. As you can tell, I'm probably a people person. Like that's what's kept me in the industry for so long. So I don't really think of the size of the company. I think about the trajectory and where they're going and does that align with my values. But uh, for me, it really depends on the leadership and kind of the people that I'm working with. That really so what is me. a good leader, a good manager from your point of view? I think for me, it's like someone that actually is going to have your back, like has the balls to stand up for you. So I think sometimes <laughs> is that how... Do you really find this picture? Yeah, I've, I've heard, yes, I do. And I've seen both. I've had ones where they haven't and like they'll throw you onto the bus to protect themselves. I've had that experience and it's not nice, but also I've got people that will actually back you and defend you as well. Um, so I think that really keeps me excited. Like I put a lot of trust in the leadership, I think. Like I'll pick the people that I want to, and I'm very loyal and I work very hard, but at the same time, I kind of want that reciprocated. I want to know that they're going to have my back. Um, and also people that maybe, you know, sometimes when things come down from global, they'll take things and actually give you what's relevant. I always take what's relevant to my partners. I'll say, no, I'll push back. I'll be difficult because I, when my partners talk to me, I want them to actually trust what I have to say. So I'll kind of pick and choose what I think is relevant, what's going to resonate for their business. I've thought about what's going to resonate before I go to them. And I kind of appreciate leaders that do the same thing as well. So do you believe in this industry you have to wait for your opportunity to knock to the, the opportunity to knock on your door or you have to chase it yourself? No, I definitely think you have to chase it yourself. Yeah. But I think you have to be open-minded too. Like for me, I, I kind of always go by the motto of like you, you should go to the company you want to go for rather than the role you want to go for because I think the role will come so later. So it's all about the logo. I, the logo but also like where the company's going and does that align with your values. So I think for me like the advice that I give to someone starting out in the industry is think about the company like Dell was a great company to start at for example. I didn't really think about the role. I was in inside sales. I was phone call calling. I was on the phones but I didn't focus on the role. Like that sort of comes as you kind of show that you're good at what you're doing, the role will evolve and change. Talk, Think about the company you're going to and the organization and where they're going to go and what they have to offer. That would be kind of the main advice I'd probably offer to people just starting out in the industry or their career. Do you think people will have the luxury to do that, to do all these researches and pick and choose these days? Well, I think it depends. Or you just jump on any job offer? That yeah, I think initially you should probably like jump into yeah. anything, I'd say. But it's like if given the choice between a role or the company, and maybe it's not the perfect role that you want, I'd say go for the company and just do any role in there. Even like I've seen people start as a receptionist, but because they've done such a good job, people have seen that and they've they progress. progressed into yeah. like very senior roles. Yeah. So I'd say like, you know, beggars can't be choosers. You start in whatever you can to prove yourself and build your network. Yeah. But but given the choice between your perfect role in a company you're not sure about or a role that's not ideal in a company that you think is going to do really well, like go for the company. That's kind of what I'd suggest. Excellent. So. What is really your message or your advice to the new generation, people who would love to just to jump into yeah. IT and work in this business? What is your message from your, for what you have experienced so yeah. far? I think like to be long-sighted. Like I think your behavior every day, people are going to remember you. So what you've done, like what I've done 16 years ago, people I've met, they're going to remember me. So I just think really be long-sighted. Don't be short-sighted. Don't burn bridges. Like every company I've left, I've left in a really good way. To the point where I've had managers come back and be my manager again. And I think I just always thought very carefully of when I left and did the right thing always, you know, when I left the company very thorough, did good handovers. So every time I change roles, I think how you change a job is just as important as how you start a job. And people don't think like that. They put their best foot forward, like dating, you know, put your best foot forward when you first start a job. But I think one big thing for me is like, I've changed role a couple of times, but how you leave an organization is just as important as how you start an organization. So that's probably one thing I'd say. Away. Can you man maintain your identity within big environments yeah. or do you, do you really have to play the game and just go no, with No, I don't those? think so. I think, um, like, I think you have to have an opinion and a stance and back yourself. Like, don't be wishy-washy. But I definitely think you can. Maybe it takes longer to build that credibility because there's so many other people you're working with. But don't they say you're like the, the average of the five people you spend the most time with? Like, if you're around a high-performing team and everyone's amazing, yes, it's harder to stand out, but I think it lifts you up and your caliber up as well. Yeah. So I think it's important to kind of keep that in mind. 100%. Tanya, what's next for you? Um, I mean, I mentioned, I think, earlier to you before, like I'm not necessarily like 
I want to be the CEO of a company. Like I'm very ambitious. I want to do my best. My role is relatively new. So I want to do the best I can in my role, but I want to be a role model in how I do things. And for me, it's like showing people that you can have your personal values aligned with your work values and kind of act as a guiding principle. And as I mentioned earlier as well, like eventually I want to give back and actually help people as well. Um, so I don't know what it could be. It could be like even going into a not-for-profit or helping more outside of what I'm doing in my industry, like taking my knowledge in my industry in cyber and maybe taking that and applying that elsewhere. It's kind of where I see myself. Um, but yeah, right now it's kind of just staying afloat, being a mum <laughs> and being good at my job. And my role is relatively new. 2023 has been a big year for me. Um, so I just think for me, there's a lot of opportunity where I am now and I just want to grow and be the best that I can. Excellent. This is your final chance to say something for your sponsors. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what would you tell them? Honestly, I'm like very grateful to them, I think. I think um, being a sponsor is an interesting thing because there's risk attached to the sponsors as well. So it's like if they're going to advocate for you, too, yeah. yeah, if they're going to advocate for you and you don't do a good job, then they're going to be looking bad themselves. But if you do a good job, then it, they look good as well. And I always feel like very responsible when people have sponsored me to kind of do that. So I'm very grateful because I think the last couple of roles have had these amazing people just tap me on the shoulder that have backed me and obviously had confidence in my ability to kind of refer me into opportunities. And I'm very grateful and a lot of gratitude to those people because that's what's helped me get to where I am. More so than mentors, a lot of people talk about mentorship and mentors. It's really been my sponsors that have actually kind of landed me my next job and promotion. Who so. believed in you. Yeah, it was. And then I felt a sense of responsibility because I didn't want to let them down. And that drove me even further to kind of put a lot of pressure on myself. My husband like hates it when I start a new job. He's like, you turn into a crazy person <laughs> for the first three months. It's like an obsession. I work day, night, weekend. But I just, you know, when you start a new job, there's a lot to learn. And I think that's that balance between work and family. It's like sometimes that has to give so I can kind of find my feet in my new role before I, you know. <laughs> Fantastic. Tanya, thank you so much for being no here No worries. Today. It was fun. It was a pleasure. Survived my first podcast, Rowan. <laughs> I appreciate it. Look, thank you so much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. you. Can you tell us uh, about your experience with Brains Plat Podcast? Well, it was definitely outside of my comfort zone. I've never done a podcast before. Um, I'm not really used to kind of meshing my personal and like work life together. But I've realized when I look at role models and people who I admire in the industry, it's really... I'm always curious as to how they do both and how they kind of align those values. So, you know, it's time for me to have a, have a go. And, um, I started a new job this year. That was something that made me uncomfortable. And now to end the year with a podcast was a good way to finish. Okay. Would you recommend Brands Plot to other guests? Yeah, definitely. And I've also seen the lineup of guests you have coming up as well. So I think it's going to be amazing. So tune in. Excellent. Thank you, Tanya. Thanks. The concept of certain individual being destined for success regardless of the path they choose, is indeed an intriguing one. Tanya's story paints a picture of someone who possesses qualities or attributes that seamlessly fit into various situations, a kind of universal adaptability that leads to success. And hey, if there are these invisible forces out there steering us to success without us even realizing them, why not giving them a little shout out and hope they swing by our way too. Until next time, take care.